The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. So this is uh, Tim Fowler. He's a network engineer and a community evangelist for uh, Sabaya Technology. Did I pronounce that right? Yes. All right. All right. I never pronounce things right. Anyhow, he's here to talk about Docker, which is a way to containerize a lot of stuff. And so I'm going to leave it with him. Take it away, Tim. All right. Let's get rocking and rolling. So we'll just do this for a second. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to actually start with a, do um, a demo real quick. And can you all hear me? Everybody good? All right, cool. All right, so if you, can you everybody see the screen pretty good? All right, so what we're looking at here is what's called a Docker file. This is essentially like a make file, if you will. Um, and so what we're going to do is actually we're going to compile this container real quickly, and then I can actually launch my presentation because it's inside this container that was a really smart idea. Nope. <laughs> I. All right, so what we're going to do, um, nope, that's not going to work. I'm going to talk really, really loud for a few minutes until we get into the mic fix because that's the only way I'm going to get it. All right, so we got the build. Da -da -da. Check. All right, so here's the thing. Docker 1.0 just was released last week, and it's no longer Docker. It's Docker.io. So what we're doing is we're going through and actually going to build this container out right quick. It's pretty fast. All right. Cool beans. So just doing some app get goodness and... All right, can you all hear me? Yes, sir. All right, cool. So we're going to let this build for just a couple, hopefully a few more seconds. Um, and then we'll launch it. Um, and we'll actually jump into what really Docker is all about, um, which is actually why I'm here. All right, so we're going to do docker.io run d p 8000 8000 self. Uh, there will be a test on this command at the end of the presentation. Um, you will not be allowed to leave until you successfully. <laughs> uh, sorry. All right. So, if you look down here, I got this really, really long. Um, essentially, it's a hash. What this is is this is basically the unique ID for my container. So, let's exit out of this and open up a browser. And now we'll start the actual presentation. Hopefully. Tomorrow. <laughs> I knew this was going to bite me in the butt. Why um, because, because I screwed my graphics up on my actual laptop. So um, yeah, this seemed like a really good fix. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> I don't even know what I just went to, so that's not good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is it doing? This is not going well. Actually, I think this one's going to be 1.1. 1 1. Yeah! <laughs> That's Docker. Y'all have a good night. Because <laughs> I am done. This is already gone really, really badly. Um, 
So at least we can have fun and y'all can laugh at my expense. I'll cry, I'll cry later. Um, so, okay, so now the actual meat of the presentation. Docker containerizing the revolution. Um, and it actually says Docker logo because I broke the internet. Um, who am I? Uh, I am Tim Fowler, network or project engineer. I was a network now, I'm project engineer at Sabai Technology. Uh, we do open source routing platforms and things like that. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Rubix. Please no hate comments after the last five minutes. Um, a little bit about me. I'm Christian. I do frequent, uh, at least speak at different events, uh, both in um, kind of the enterprise environment as well as InfoSec security. I do a lot of wireless talks. Um, if you see me in Starbucks, smiling, run. Um, <laughs> Uh, I love Wi-Fi packets. Um, I'm an open source enthusiast, and I'm founder of Docker Greenville. Uh, so let's quickly, what is Docker? Uh, Docker is an open source project to easily create lightweight, portable, self-sufficient containers from any application. Everybody with me? So the same container that a developer builds in and tests in on a laptop can be deployed into production, regardless of whether it's a VM, bare metal, OpenStack, public clouds, personal clouds, doesn't matter. Whatever we develop in, it's the same thing that we're, we're uh, pushing out into production. So a little bit about Docker. Docker was created by a company called Dot Cloud Incorporated that later changed their name to Docker. Uh, it was uh, written in Go. If any Go fans here? All right, y'all were weird. Um, no, uh, I, no, no. Uh, the current version is 1.0, just released last Monday. This is the first production release. Uh, so they're finally like, hey, everybody that's been using Docker in production for the last eight months, you can now use it in production. Um, they introduced a lot of really good fixes. Um, so currently there's about 426 contributors on GitHub. Uh, there's over, I think now there's over 8,500 commits and about 60% of those now are outside the company, which is really, really awesome. The, the community behind Docker is really huge and they're really passionate and they're just moving this thing forward a, a lot. So it's not just the company, it's actually the community. Um, there's over 11,000 GitHub uh, stars forked over 2,000 times for applications. And currently there's over 14,000 applications to date built off Docker. Um, these are like standalone applications and these are also entire ecosystems built around Docker. And so it's a really, really fast developing community and it's becoming a really, really thorough and robust community. So if Docker is, is something cool, there has to be a problem. Like if it's a new technology, it's obviously gonna have to solve some kind of dilemma. And so what specifically is the dilemma that Docker solves? No image. <laughs> awesome. This is not going well. All right. Yeah, let me let me see if um, I'm on I'm on a Chromebook. I don't have Ethernet. I'm on Wi-Fi. You're right. Because somebody Zach Underwood put a capture portal on this thing. So this rough presentation thus far is brought to you by Global Vision. No, I'm just kidding. They're, they're a really awesome company, and I shouldn't have said that. Um, so let's actually get a legitimate. Probably. I'm connected. Uh, it's just being slow to load. I do apologize, guys. Okay, so here's the problem, okay? If, if you look on the top half, we have all these different services, entities, things. We've got static websites, we've got user databases, queues, analytic databases, API endpoints, web front ends, all this stuff, all this code. We've got stuff in Java, we've got stuff in Python, we've got stuff in Ruby and JavaScript and HTML and all this other stuff and we've got to deploy it on the bottom half. 
So we've got development VMs, we've got QA servers, production clusters, contributor laptops and stuff. So the real problem is how do we make all that stuff on the top work on everything on the bottom? And it's, it's, not, it's not exactly an easy solution to, to this problem, but it's not a unique problem uh, just that we have in our industry. So what happens is you have this matrix from hell, which is a really cool thing that Docker kind of coined. And it's just showing, it's like, how do you do this? How do I get the static website to deploy in a unified manner on development and in production? Like these are things that we actually battle with on a, on a, on a daily basis, um, especially if you're in DevOps, like it's a nightmare. It's, it's just an absolute nightmare to go, well it, well, it worked on my machine, it doesn't work on mine, so it's useless. And so this is really what the problem that, we're, that Docker's trying to solve. But as I said, Docker was, this is not a unique problem uh, to our industry. This problem was actually solved about 50 years ago. So we're gonna look at another industry. Uh, cargo transport pre-1960 was a nightmare. So you have, a, let's say, uh, anybody like coffee? Coffee fans? Most of us probably, because we, we live on computers, so we have to. Um, so if you're, if you're a coffee plantation owner, prior to 1958 you know, in South America, and you want to ship coffee to Charlotte, North Carolina, here's how you did it. Well, you harvest the coffee, you put it in bags, you put bags into a truck, the truck goes to a train, the train then takes it to a port, the port then loaded on a ship, the ship goes to a port, then you reverse the whole process, and it's finally delivered to the Southeast Linux Fest 2014, which if you paid attention, that was like a 68-year trip. Um, <laughs> It's not very fresh. So what it, and the, the problem is, is the plantation owner, the person selling his coffee, has to worry about every single of those transportation modes as far as what is his product going to be like. Because the coffee is in bags. And you don't know what coffee is, is being shipped next to. Um, it may be shipped to a baby grand, next to a baby grand piano that falls over in the middle of transit across the ocean and crushes the beans. So the... the, the buyer doesn't want to pay for crushed beans and the sellers out of a bunch of money and so the, the, the problem is that you have to worry about every uh, connection, every segment of the chain from beginning to end and that's our, in the traditional sense of development all the way to deployment that's what we have to worry about we have to worry about the, the distribution and the, the transportation and how it runs in each of these environments so at around 1958 and you can see we had, the, this is the exact same problem. How do we transport all these different goods in the, in the same seamless manner without putting them all at risk? So they came up with this really cool idea to solve their matrix of hail called the intermodal shipping container. Sometime around 1958, they came up with a standard of three different sizes shipping containers. And what it basically allowed is for, as a, as a, uh, proprietary of some product, I can pack that container with his, to the brim with my product. And then a truck can come pick it up and take it to the train. The train takes it to the port, the port put, loads it onto a ship, the ship takes it up. Same process. But guess what? I don't have to worry what's packed next to it because I'm in a protected environment. My product is safe. So if, if I've got coffee and somebody else is shipping a pack of wolves, which is a, I don't care. It doesn't matter, you know. The other thing that it did for the shipping industry, not only does it protect, you know, kind of the, the, the end points of both the consumer and the provider, but it did something really revolutionary for the actual transportation, uh, transportation uh, system. It made it so much more efficient. They started making boats this wide by this wide because they knew exactly how many containers they could put on it. The same things with trains, same thing with trucks. You could actually plan and officially coordinate the transportation of goods because you had a standard unit of measurement that you were operating in. It doesn't matter what's in it. As long as it fits in there, I'm going to ship it. Well, I think UPS had that. If it fits, it ships or something. Um, yeah, that's exactly what, what the, the industry did. And so that's the approach that Docker has taken. So you put everything in, into these containers, and then you ship them. Doesn't matter by rail train, or rail and train is the same thing, um, ship, it doesn't matter. It just works. I can put my product in. I don't have to worry that, you know, Jim's over here shipping Wolverines. It just doesn't matter. So 
What Docker ultimately is, is a container for shipping code. So by putting all of these elements, the, these top elements of static websites, DBs, all this stuff, into this container. So I've got a uniform, standardized pro, uh, container that I can now put on a development VM, a QA server, public cloud, production cluster, doesn't matter. I can take the same container and ship it. So if I develop in a container and everything works out, everything tests good, I'm sending it. And when they deploy, when, when my operations team deploys that container in production, it's the exact same as it is when I very first started. It, highly portable, highly efficient, and easily controlled because you know everything's self-contained. So in, in, this, in this production code environment that we, you know, we're always, we, especially with like continuous integration and stuff, we're always pushing code. We've got to have a, a, a methodology that allows us to quickly and efficiently pump our code from development all the way into production continuously and stuff without worrying about what's going to happen, all these, you know, has anybody tried running multiple applications on the same server and then have dependency conflicts? Happens all the time. Well, if I can wrap all the dependencies in a container, now I can have application one, application two, application three, application four, all with a different set of de dependencies and they're happy because they're all within their container. So why do developers care? Build once, finally, run anywhere. That alone is really, really awesome. Knowing that I can only have to build this thing one time and I can run it anywhere that this infrastructure is supported, which Docker is basically supported in every minute major Linux distribution now. Ubuntu uh, has it in the native uh, 1404 repos. Uh, Debian's got it. Uh, Red Hat's got it. Fedora's got it. Basically, most of the major ones, you get it. It's really, really easy. Um, in fact, you can run Docker on a Raspberry Pi if you want to. Um, it's a little wonky, but you can do it. Um, but why you want to, I'm not sure. So you have a clean, safe, hygienic, and portable runtime environment for your app. Um, I don't worry about what this other application is doing, what kind of dependencies, what kind of services it's running. I just don't worry about it. I want to build what I need to build, and that's it. I'm shipping it because I've wrapped everything in this nice, you know, nice bow and sent it off to DevOps and they're like, thank you. Uh, you don't have to worry about missing dependencies, packages, or other pain points. You got an application deployed and all of a sudden a bunch of updates drop. Breaks your application. Anybody been there? I definitely have been there. This prevents that. Because in a container, you basically set the environment. So imagine setting all these environmental variables. It's locked in there. So unless you actually go and do the upgrade yourself, that container, the application inside that container will continue to run as the first day you developed it. So you don't have to worry about all these missing dependencies. And you also don't have to worry about, all right, how do I build out the production cluster to mimic the development environment? Like, I, I don't have to worry about it. I don't care. I just need to be able to support be able to run that container and let it do its job. So another reason why developers care is that you can run each app in its own isolated container. Uh, so you can run various versions of libraries and other dependencies with apps within each app without worrying. I can run Python 2 and Python 3. I can run different versions of Ruby. All in the same, all in the same host but they're in different containers, so I don't have to worry about that. So if I've got a legacy application that requires an early version of Ruby, awesome. Or if I need, if I got one to sit beside it that's using a, a bleeding edge, doesn't matter. Because the container contains all the dependencies and libraries that it needs, and it doesn't worry about the externals. So automatic testing and integration, packaging, anything you can script, you can ship. So really cool. Yes, question. Well, 
Um, I will actually get to that a little bit later. Okay, so just 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 hold hold on to that. Um, you reduce eliminate the concerns and compatibility on different platforms, um, specifically your customers. If you've ever had to deploy an app, a custom application on a customer's box, that can be a real pain point. But with utilizing Docker, it's not because as long as their their system actually supports Docker, so a relatively new system running kernel 3.8 and later, you basically have full support of this thing. You can deploy it. It's not a pain point any longer. Cheap, zero penalty containers to deploy services. Very cheap. Nearly free containers. Um, it's a VM without the overhead of a VM. Um, now understand, Docker uh, containers is not virtualization. You have some virtualization going on, specifically like in the network and stuff like this, but it is not, it is not an actual virtualization uh, solution. It also allows for instant replay and reset of image snapshots. And that's really powerful. I can build up an app, destroy it immediately, and then spin up the same exact version in a matter of seconds. And seconds really matter. I mean, everybody, we love VMs because they're, they're fast. Like, they're so much faster than bare metal in terms of deploying and stuff like that. Um, Docker just makes VMs look like bloatware. Um, because I can typically deploy a, a, a web server in about 30 milliseconds running on Ubuntu 14.04, 12.04, 10.04 if I want to. Um, Fedora, CentOS, doesn't matter. I can do it really, really fast. Docker, because of the nature of, of, of Docker, it's operating basically at bare metal performance, and we'll get into that just a little bit. The other question that you really have to ask is, why do DevOps care? Configure once, run anything. That's, that in itself, to me, is, is all I need to know. Like, the fact that I can just... I can set this up one time, and I can run it anywhere. I can put it on your laptop. I can put it in your production server. It just works. It makes my job easier. The entire life cycle is much more efficient, consistent, and repeatable. Specifically with continuous integration stuff, where we're always pushing codes and stuff, uh, and, and changes and modifications and potentially security updates. This is a very fast system, so I can sit here. I can make a change. I can commit it to a new image, and then I can deploy that image just really, really fast. So as you get into security vulnerabilities and things like that, you actually can be very, very responsive. You can increase the quality of code produced by developers because they don't have to worry about how you're deploying it. They're not the coffee plantation owner that's worried about how you're going to transport. They're just not worried about it. They get to focus on the code. You get to focus on how to actually do the deployment which in theory should offer better code, but developers, yeah. Um, eliminate inconsistencies between development, test production, and customer environments. It works on my machine, it works on yours. Uh, biggest thing is this does support segregation of duties, which is most of you guys in the enterprise know this is actually a really big deal. Let, letting specific people do their specific job instead of having everybody do one thing. Docker helps support this. It significantly improves the speed and reli uh, re reliability of continuous deployment and continuous integration systems, as I said. And because the containers are so lightweight, it addresses significant performance cost, deployment, and portability uh, issues that are normally associated with VMs. Okay? The perfect example, if I, got a, if I got a two terabyte VM, database VM, and I want to duplicate it. So now I have two two terabyte VMs. And it's like, all right, that's really, really painful. Or better yet, I want to duplicate it and make one change. So now I have a two terabyte VM and a two terabyte and four meg VM. Well, I actually have now, I've consumed over four gigs of space. Docker doesn't do that. It actually, and we'll get into how it uses the layered file system, it actually can share resources if it needs to. So I have one copy, and I only copy the delta changes. So if I've got application A, and then I make a change to application A and commit that, I just, I'm, all I'm doing is storing the de delta. So literally, my application will be four megs on top of the base image. It will actually show how that works, why it works. The biggest thing is, is because it does allow for separation of concerns. Um, anybody here named Dan? Are you a developer? 
oh, I, 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 went, I, was, I was one for one last time. So, um, so Dan, the developer, this is, this is his role. Um, he worries about what's inside the container, the libraries, the code, how it all runs, does it actually run, all that stuff, his package management, his apps, his data, and because we all know all Linux servers look the same, right? Y'all with me? No, it, it's, it's, they're, they're common, but they're not all the same, um, especially if you're dealing with customer servers that they don't know what they're doing. So he, he has to be concerned about this stuff. Like, okay, well, I know that if I do this, this works and stuff, and this, it, but all these edge cases that you have to account for and stuff is really burdensome for Dan, the developer. He's actually worrying about things that's not his job, like deploying this code. How is he going to deploy it? Write the code, make it work, send it off to the next guy. Peter, anybody named Peter? A uh, question. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so the question was, if you develop something on a, an Ubuntu box, uh, container, can you deploy it on a Red Hat? Yes. Absolutely. No. Well, it, right now, Docker 64-bit. So, it's, it, that, and that's really about, I mean, you can, you can do some 32-bit stuff and all, but no, the architecture doesn't even have to be the same. Um, what, um, I, I don't, I'm actually not 100%, I don't think so on that. But yeah, so, so the actual, yeah, you're right. The x86 would have to be the same. Um, but outside of that, the operating system, all that stuff is, is kind of agnostic. Um, so, that, and that's, that's the beauty. So that if you've got somebody that's, you know, they like doing all their development in Fedora, but all of your production servers are Ubuntu, it doesn't matter because they're working inside of this and whatever's inside is what actually matters. So the ops guy, Peter, he worries about everything that's outside the container. Um, things such as like logging and how you're gonna do, do remote access, monitoring what's going on inside and outside the container, network configurations, where's this thing gonna live on the network, what kind of access is gonna be there, how do I start, stop, access, migrate, all this stuff, these containers. Okay, this is what the operations guy's job, this is his job description to worry about these things. Uh, and this is, Docker helps facilitate this. He's not so much concerned that, you know, it's a Java application inside the container versus, you know, a Python application. It doesn't matter. Uh, all he has to do is build his, build the systems, build the infrastructure based off this common variable of that it supports the Docker containers, and then he can focus on all of the administrative stuff of maintaining, you know, the monitoring and remote access and things like that. So. One of the common questions is, don't VMs actually solve everything we've talked about? I mean, they, you get a, you, it, essentially you put it in a package, the VM's the VM, so if I, I don't have to worry about dependencies or anything because it's all in there. Um, VMs aren't really portable um, once you get into large, but they, they are technically portable. Um, so it solves a lot of the problems, right? Well, no, not even close because one VMs do it so inefficiently. <clears throat> so here we have um, kind of this traditional VM infrastructure on the left. So you've got your server, your bare metal, you've got your host operating system, then you have a hypervisor, which um, even the best of hypervisors eat resources. That alone can be a problem. And so then we have, we look at application A. We have a new guest operating system, we have all our bins, libraries, and all that stuff needed. And then we have our actual application sitting on top. So, so we've got this entire, this, ver this vertical stack of application A. Well, and then you jump over, and so we've got A that we've made a slight modification to. Well, in order to make a slight modification on a VM and still have the existing one there, you have to do a, you have to do a replication or a clone. You have to copy it then make your change, which means you have a full version of the operating system, a second version of the libraries and bins, and then a second version of the application. And so every time you do this, you're, you're, you're eating a lot of resources that aren't 100% necessary. And so then the same thing when you get to application B, which is a completely different thing, you 
you've got a new guest operating system, a new set of bins and libraries, and then you've got the application on that. And so if you make changes, you've got to do it again. Yeah? You could do that. Um, and that does make it a lot more efficient. Um, but not everybody does that. And that's the biggest thing is that, um, so the question was, uh, why not use like device ma uh, mapper and stuff? And, and, and the, specifically the reason why I'm putting this is in my presentation is because I don't find that people actually do that. Most of them are actually just doing straight clones and eating up their resources. So, but that is a, that is a very valid point. So if we jump over to the, the right side in the, app, uh, the container, we have our server, we have our host operating system, which is agnostic, as long as it's running a relatively modern kernel and has the, Go, uh, I mean the uh, Docker binary installed on it, you're pretty well good. And so what happens is now you've got, uh, if you look, we've got application A, and then we have essentially a, ch a modified version of application A. And they're sharing the same bins and libraries because, well, I only need one copy. And it just makes it a lot more efficient so I don't have all this overhead of, of, of an entire operating system and all these, you know, multiple copies of the same library on the host. I have it one time. Or if I need a different version of a library, then it actually makes that in the change. So that'll be a, a differential between A and, and the change of A. And then you jump over to B. So in this case, we've got four applications of B, or four versions of B, but the libraries are the same. So the example of this is like if you had um, like a, a customer, uh, let me think, of something where you have multiple instances for four different customers. Like the underlying is the same, you just, they're logging into a different place or something like that. I don't need four exact duplicate copies of all of this stuff just to make it run. So I can actually share all these libraries and bins and stuff. And then you have Docker to the side that's actually acting as your controller to do all of this stuff. Yes? Yes, okay. you can run it in any, I mean, so let's say you've got a, a, a rail VM, rail seven, because that just dropped. Um, so you've got a rail seven VM, yeah, you can put Docker in that and then run the containers on top of that. Uh, sorry, the question was, um, if you've got a VM, can you actually run Docker inside of that and then do all the container support? And, the, and it's absolutely yes. Um, so we'll move on. So a little bit of how the Docker actually works, and there's been some great talks on some of the elements. <laughs> Um, is the, the biggest thing, it, one potential pitfall of Docker is it is a shared kernel. Whatever kernel the host is, is the, the kernel that all the containers have. So if you do require a, a, diff, a unique kernel, that can be a problem. And that's a, a solution that VMs solve better than containers. Containers are not the end all be all solution. And the reason why it's not is because we still have bare metal servers when virtual machines are the best thing that's ever been created. There's, a, there's application for all of it. But it uses Linux namespaces and C groups as well as a union and file system, which gives it uh, unique uh, PIDs, process trees. You have unique mount points, network, uh, inter process communication, user accounts, host names, memory CPU, disk IO, all that stuff. All the really cool stuff that um, I, uh, Adam Grimm, I believe, talked about in C groups uh, yesterday. That's what Docker's built off of. Uh, being able to control and utilize these C groups for, for isolation as well as the, uh, the, na the kernel namespaces. So Docker combines and standardizes a number of existing Linux components. Most of them are from Linux containers, LXC, uh, which is what Docker was originally built off of. Um, LXC has, for the most part, been deprecated in the Docker world um, for libcontainer. Uh, which is basically, uh, it replaces a lot of LXC. It has direct interaction with the kernel instead of having kind of that middle layer. Um, and it's a project that's actually being, uh, it's been split off of Docker um, and they're maintaining it as a separate project. So, um, but basically anything 3.8 kernel wise, you can pretty much support. So how does the union file system, because this is where the, the, the really, um, everything truly happens now that we've actually got our namespace. We've got 
you know, dedicated C groups for CPU utilization, memory utilization, utilization, all that stuff. How do we actually get it to do the, the cool stuff that makes Docker? So each layer of the file system is mounted on top of the previous layer. So when I build in a Docker application, I start off with a base image. And so typically I, I, I live in Ubuntu world, and so I typically will use Ubuntu. So what I'll do is I'll, if I don't already have it, I'll download the Ubuntu, Ubuntu image and I'll start there. And then let's say I want to install Apache. So I go and I install Apache into the, on top of the Docker layer. And it actually writes it out as a new layer on top of the base image. And then if I commit that, now I've got a whole new image instead of Apache image. But what's happening is the Ubuntu base is bare minimum. Like, it is smaller than the minimum server installation. Like a lot of the stuff you're used to having in an Ubuntu, you don't. Because it turns out you don't actually need it. The, the concept behind these things to keep them lightweight and efficient is you install what you need. We're not going to give you what we think you need. So things like, I'm a nano guy, don't kill me, please. Um, nano doesn't exist in Docker. Like, you have to, I have to actually sudo app get install nano if I want to use nano. It's very, very bare minimum. So then I go and do a, an Apache install. So now I've got a web server. I've got a, a really lightweight, and I commit that. Awesome. So now I can use that Apache image, and I can send out 65,000, you know, entire uh, class, uh, or uh, slash 16 of web servers based off this one little image. And it's all it's doing is actually is sharing the base image and just using the Apache layer 65,300 whatever times. Um, so the first layer is always the base image. There are 14,000 plus base images right now um, that's actually in the Docker hub. You can actually create your own, do whatever you want. So the current base images include Debian, Ubuntu, BusyBox, Fedora, CentOS. Um, see, we've got Node.js, we've got uh, PHP, we've got Python, um, Redis, Memcache. I mean, just anything that most people are using, there's actually already base images to do these things with. So each uh, read-only layer is called an image. And the container, which is actually the very top layer, is the only thing that's actually writable. Uh, the top layer is, is only modifiable, and it's actually termed the container. So basically, any changes off that base image that I make, that's what we're actually classifying as the container. The other, everything under that is just resources. Yes? Yes. Uh, yes and no, actually. So the question is, is anybody testing the base images that are uploaded? So Docker has uh, partnered with GitHub to do what's called trusted builds. And so in order to actually get a trusted build, all the code, and specifically the Docker file that was used to build the image, has to be submitted on GitHub so that they can actually, they've got their team can go and validate that it's, you're not doing something stupid or anything like that, that you're doing a, running a system with escalated privileges and, and trying to run everything as root and potentially causing chaos and stuff. So yeah, there is, there is a way to kind of validate that the uh, containers are trustworthy. One point of note, if you don't know where the Docker containers are came from and they're not trusted built, build them yourself. Because I can upload an image to the uh, hub that I built myself with zero documentation and without a, without a Docker file. And I just tell you, hey, this is what's in it. You actually have no idea what's in it. The good thing is they made it extremely easy to build your own. So you don't have to really trust anybody. Uh, no, not yet. Um, and and I, don't, I don't know if that's something they're looking at. The question was, is there any digital signing in, as you build containers and stuff? Um, not that I'm aware of, so it could be. So now we're actually going to try to do a hopefully not failed demos this time. Is that good? All right, so I got to remember Docker IO because they just changed it. So, yeah, I had to just had, I had to reboot, do my Chromebook yesterday. So, um, yeah, so this is this is the current version. It's a uh, um, actually I'm not even running the latest current. That's awesome. Um, 
So the, the current is 1.0. It is a production release. Um, they did a lot of, um, let's see, they, they increased their ButterFS performance uh, and um, support. So if any ButterFS guys, Docker actually plays really, really well with that. So if you're doing replication snapshots and stuff, really, really cool to pair those two together. Um, they did away with the dependency of using Linux bridging. So I can actually bridge all the containers network directly to my physical host uh, interface. So if I've got a host that's just, you know, ETH0, I can actually pull DHCP off of ETH0 from the rest of my router. So, or I can have a localized network if I want, and I can actually do localized networks within the networks and stuff. So it's actually got a lot of uh, networking capability and stuff, and it's been really impressive. It's really awesome if you combine it with like Open vSwitch for doing software switching and stuff. It's just really, really impressive. So here I've got just two images currently right now. I've got the self image, which is what we're actually, we're just looking at. And so I've got the Ubuntu. So if I want to actually pull an image that I don't have, um, I'll pull one. I won't do it the fully. Network's unreachable. Yeah. I. Oh, my wireless got turned off in the middle of the presentation. That's cool. Um, yeah, so with within the, the, the Docker has a really, really good API that you can connect to um, both. You, obviously, you got a great command line interface, but they also got a really robust API. Um, any DigitalOcean fans here? I, I, I personally love DigitalOcean. Nothing against Linode if you guys are here. Y'all were cool too. I just like DigitalOcean just a little bit better. Um, they actually have an entire uh, Docker um, VPS that you can buy. It's like $5 a month and it's ready to go. You can use the uh, remote API keys. And so like if I want to deploy applications, I can actually just remotely from, from my Chromebook or any other laptop just send them straight to DigitalOcean and they're rock and rolling ready to run. Let's see. All right, so I'm not going to pull an image because I don't need to. You're connected. <laughs> I quit my job. <laughs> not yet. Yeah, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, thank you, for Zach. Um, so yeah, let's do. Let's just do quickly, and I'm not going to actually pull the whole thing um, because it will take more time than I actually want to. But if you look, you'll see a bunch of these uh, like random number sets. It's actually pulling. It's pulling it layer by layer. So if somebody built this, they they would uh, do it, make a change, and it would save a layer, and they'd save a layer, save a layer, save a layer. And what actually happens is because of the way it's done in layer, you actually can download in parallel. So you're actually instead of pulling this entire like ISO at a time, I'm actually able to pull layer after layer after layer after layer, and then it stitches them together at the very end. Um, so that's just one cool. That's kind of fast. Yes? I'm not sure. The question was, is it downloading sequential or random? I, I'm not sure. I haven't actually gone through and looked. Um, what I, basically what it could do is just calc cat the output to a file and then look at the history of the container and then I could probably find out. But my guess is, my guess is it's sequential, um, but I'm just not actually sure. Yes? Yes, yes. Yes, that, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. E e each of those layers is a, is a, it's literally just a series of files. It may just be a single file or it could be a bunch of files simultaneously depending on how large that actual layer of change was. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, we'll scroll. So if we if we just look at some of the options within the Docker command line, you've got attach, which is essentially like SSH. I can actually lead, latch on to a running container, and I can look at its processes, do all that stuff, um, build, commit, 
Uh, it uses kind of a, a versioning system very much like Git, as that you can, it's, it's, you can actually, I can roll back an entire image if I need to, to a specific layer. Um, so if like we make a change and it just doesn't work right, I can, we can actually go back. But most people don't do that because it's just so easy just to spin up a new version of, of the existing image. One that's really cool is I can import existing tarballs and convert them into a Docker container. So if I've got a file system, like on a physical machine, I can tarball that and then import it into uh, Docker and then I'll have basically it's like a, a poor man's P2B system. Um, uh, let's see. Um, somebody, somebody give me an application that they use. That Salt stack. Salt stack. That's not, they're not going to have, they've got support, but they're, it's not going to be a standalone container. Um, I heard Redis. Somebody say Redis? All right, let's see. Um, One D. So what this is going to do is this is actually going to reach out to the to the Docker uh, index, which is now Docker Hub, and it's actually going to search for all of the the titles of Redis and stuff. And on this wireless, it may be a little bit slow, but yeah. So we've got lots and lots of entries for people that have created their own Redis installations and stuff. Some of them are telling you, hey, this is running on 1204, and this is where it can get a little tricky because most like. The best solution is to build it yourself, figure it out. Unless there's a very well-documented container, you probably want to do it yourself because, well, I just don't trust people. Um, sorry, I just don't. I mean, if it's my application and my services and my customers and I'm dependent on it, I want to make sure that, I, I, that it's actually. So you have the ability to search for existing containers and things like that. <clears throat> so. Um, what we'll do quickly is we're just going to spin up a, a, a brand new Ubuntu um, container um, just to show you how fast it is. So we do Docker run. I'm going to do dash I for interactive so I can actually uh, see inside the container, dash T so that I get a TTY and I can actually type. And I'm going to do Ubuntu. And I do have to pass it a command or it won't know what to do. So we're just going to do bin slash bash, not dot, but slash bash. All right, so understand this doesn't exist. We haven't created this Ubuntu container. What? Valid browser. Hmm? Ah. Yeah. There we go. All right. It's up. If you notice, my uh, my my bash prompt changed, and so I've got I've now got root at this five four six. This is the host name of this container. Um, so if I do, uh, let's see, if I do it, you name, I'm on 13.3. This is actually the kernel of the host. Um, uh, so I'm on 14.04 LTS, which just happens to be the same because I, I didn't indicate um, I didn't put a tag of latest or anything like that. Uh, somebody asked about interface. Um, interesting. So, uh, 172.17.0.3. It, it's, it's, it, it's running, if I open up another contain, um, and let's see. If you look and you see the uh, Docker.0, that's actually a Linux bridge that it automatically set up. So I have the option to run an internal network, or I can actually send it out to the host network if I want to for, for whatever. Always, for the most part, for development, I just do it. Um, so you know, if I jump back in here and clean this up, you know, I can ping Google eventually. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm, I'm operating inside of this container. So if I exit and do a docker.io and ps, which is, um, you can see that I have a container running um, and it's called self latest. Um, and, it's, and you can actually see the command here a little bit that is, I'm just running python dash m uh, dot server that is actually hosting the, uh, the presentation. 
if I do a Docker PS-A for all, I can look and see, I can actually see this 546EF that I had just started and exited. I can see that I created it two minutes ago, I ran bin slash bash, and then I exited. So now that I've got, uh, I've got that existing container and it's stopped, I can actually just start it back. Which it will, and then see, actually it wants to attach. I didn't, the, uh, in Docker you have dash I for interactive and dash D for daemonize. One thing that's very important in Docker is you have to have a, a long running process. As soon as the last process exits, the container exits. So like when I passed it bin slash bash and I typed exit, that ended the bash session, it ended the bash process, so the container actually ceased to exist at that point. Yeah, because I attached to it. Yeah, so I, it was actually stopped, so I just attached back to it, which actually caused it to spin back up, and now I'm back in, back in my bash session. Yes? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, no, the Docker itself does not manage the processes. Um, so inside the container, Yeah, no, so um, Docker, there's two options. Docker has its own basic init system that it can use, which you can actually, like, um, if you, specifically if you heavily rely on, like, Upstart for Ubuntu, there's actually kind of a, a way of uh, passing in an argument that'll allow you to use the, the, the container's init system versus the Docker's, what it wants to do. So you do have that option. So inside the container, it has its own process tree and everything like that, but if I jump over, maximize and somewhere if you actually look right here you'll see the docker.io attach has its own process you'll see the slash bin slash so from the host I can see all the processes that are running in all of my containers but inside the container I can only see the processes that have been assigned to that C group question Yes. It's lighter weight. It's much more resource uh, friendly. Um, in fact, an uh, engineer from IBM did some uh, comparison testing of Docker versus um, KVM. And uh, understand you're, you, you got basically kind of a pseudo virtualized versus a truly virtualized and stuff. From a CPU performance, uh, Docker was 26 times more per, um, efficient. 3x uh, memory performance. Um, it's not going to be as much with OpenVZ. The thing with OpenVZ is you still have a full system, um, and so you, and so you have all the libraries and stuff like that. It's just a lighter form of virtualization. So that's the biggest thing. Understand, for the most part, you're not going to use Docker to replace entire servers. You're going to use Docker to deploy an application. If I need to deploy WordPress. I want the minimum stuff to deploy WordPress. That's it. I don't need all this ancillary stuff. I want to be able to reduce my dependencies, the things that could potentially go wrong, like my presentation. Um, and, and so I want to minimize that, 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 that focus and stuff. So with OpenVZ, you, have, you just have, you have everything there. It's just not quite as expensive as a, like a KVM or, or something like that. All right, we've got 30 seconds. Yes. Is there is there a use case if it's a sysadmin or a sysadmin? Um, sysadmin, possibly. Um, I I do it a lot for um, because I do a lot of sysadmin stuff. I do a lot for hacking together scripts and stuff in an environment that I can quickly test instead of having to actually run it on the machine that I'm, that I'm probably about to break and stuff. Um, but this is really more designed for for from the, the production standpoint of actually pr releasing applications and things like that. There are some potential use cases. I'm gonna address your security question right quick. So like the perfect example is OpenSSL, okay?
okay? It's been a thorn in all of our sides of late if you've done anything with it with all the security updates. So if I've got an application that's relying on OpenSSL, a new vulnerability is, is released, which one's coming out like every six days now. Um, so what you, can, what you can do is, so you've got this base image that you've got deployed everywhere, okay? Well, what you do is you take that base image, you spin up a new one, you go in, you patch OpenSSL. You make a commit indicating what you've done, and then you just take and push that out to all the servers. So you still have the existing, you can, you can actually keep that original image, so if for some reason, whoa, it actually wasn't vulnerable, or you, at another instance, you didn't have to do the update. So what it does is you can actually do, update the images based off of individual fixes. So like if I need to, to update Apache and OpenSSL, I can do that, repackage it, and then just send it out to all, to send it back to production. And, and so it, it allows for this continuous development cycle. As issues come up, you just repackage it and send it back out again. Repackage it and send it back out. Question. Uh, yes, well actually what they would do is you would actually just replace um, the, uh, you, so you, and this would take a little bit of coordination, but you would actually just pull down the running container and, and, and put the, the, the new one in place. So yeah, you would have to have some kind of orchestration to do that, um, and there's plenty of tools to actually work on that, um, but that's just a little bit out, out of scope of what I do. Yes? Okay, so if the ho if the host gets infected, you're hosed, because most likely they're gonna it's gonna do something that's gonna be really really bad. Um, um, it very well could, because understanding the host is controlling everything that's happening in the Docker container, so it's potentially. Um, as far as the other way around, if you look in the news last week, there was a bleed out proof of concept that was published against Docker. It was only existent in one version, and it was patched two weeks before they actually released the, the guy released. 1.0 doesn't have that problem. They actually left a bunch of kernel options open. So if you ran a Docker container uh, as a privileged root user, which you should never do ever, then you could potentially actually bleed out into the host environment and cause a lot of nasty stuff. That's the only security case that has been documented and has already been uh, mitigated. The good thing is, there's actually an entire team that is focusing on doing security testing of this system because I mean, we've relied on like CH root and jails and all this stuff for many, many years, but there hasn't really been comprehensive studies as to and research as to what the the security implications of these things are. So, you know, my, my thought is use cautiously because there's always a chance. There's always a chance with VMs too. Um, and if somebody says that you can't bleed out of a VM, you're a liar because um, I've seen it and I've done it. So, um, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Hub. Yes. So, so it's called a registry, and you can have a private registry. The funny thing about it is the registry runs in a Docker container. Of course, yeah. But yeah, you can have, in fact, I, we've got one at my, uh, I've got one at my office, I've got one at home, I've got one on, on my personal system. So I have all my, my development uh, containers and images, and then I can just push those up uh, whenever I need, if I want them publicly available. But yeah, you certainly can run uh, this entire ecosystem in-house, which I highly recommend. So we're done. I'm out of time, I'll be outside. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. 
Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.